Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Our program is about to resume. Ladies and gentlemen, to continue our program, please welcome back to the stage Sherry Runner. I was locked up and mad at the world. I thought my life was over. I thought I did not have another chance. Now I just want a positive life and positive people around me. If I stay with positive people, I can be all that I can be. The league is helping me on the right path. They call me to make sure that I'm good. I'd like to introduce you to the young man who voiced those powerful words, a young man who, despite the main obstacles on his path, walks forward in hope, in large part because of the generous support you provide the Chicago Urban League. Here to introduce our keynote speaker, and our guests, please join me in extending a warm welcome to Equan Nooner. Thank you, Ms. Runner. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Equan Nooner. I'd like to personally thank each of you here today for supporting the Chicago Urban League. This league is my second home and my second chance. You see, I had no doubt in my life that it's safe. I mean, no, no, no doubt in my life about offering me a safe place where I can learn and grow. I made a few decisions in life that wasn't smart, like joining the gang and dropping out of school. I ended up spending some time in jail, and I was about to give up on life. When I was released last year, after serving three months in after serving three months, I still had to wear a lecture monitor bracelet for another nine months. And I didn't think anyone would hire me. Fortunately, I was referred to the league by the Cook County SAVE program. As soon as I talked to Ms. Shirley from the Urban League, I immediately knew that everything was gonna be all right. I enrolled in the Workforce Development Center and got my first ever part-time job at, at McDonald's. And I won my court case. <clears throat> the league is helping me with a plan to complete my GED and, and uh, obtain, obtaining my associate's degree and one day become a m motivational speaker. <clears throat> I have even better plans for my life and thanks to my family. Yes, I said my family at Chicago Urban League for setting me on the right path. Now I'm ready to live life to the fullest. It is now my privilege to welcome to the stage Ms. Connie Lindsay. She is the executive vice president and head of corporate social responsibility and global diversity and inclusion at Northern Trust, a key founder of the league. Not only does Ms. Lindsay help bring diversity and inclusion strategies for the Northern Trust she is a well-known pioneer in the business sector and a passionate community volunteer. She is the immediate past president of the National Board of Girl Scouts of the USA and dedicates her time serving on several boards, including the Executive Club of Chicago and the Obama Foundation, including counseling. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ms. Connie Lindsay. Good afternoon. It is indeed an honor to be a part of the League Summit Luncheon, Centennial Edition, during their 100th year of impacting the community, and having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with my friend Melody on the topic of diversity in business, a conversation that could not have come at a more transformative time in our city and nation. Melody Hobson's path to success at Ariel Investments is not only admirable, but also influential in the scope of minority businesses in Chicago. As president of Ariel Investments, her work and legacy will live on for future generations. 
Archimedes said, give me a place to stand and I can change the world. Please join me in welcoming Melody to the stage. Welcome home. Thank you. It's great to be here. And it's not far away from the office. Exactly. <laughs> so you could tell from the buzz in the room and the pictures, we're all delighted and honored. And I am particularly honored, Melody, we're to have this friends. conversation. We are. We are. And so you're going to get a chance to have insight into some of the conversations we've had in spas and on the phone. But I'll start with uh, one question. It was, how has your life experience made you the leader you are today? Wow, that's a big opener. <laughs> um, I mean, there are a lot of directions I can go with that answer, but I think I will start with where we all start, which is our family. And my sister is in this room, Kat Hamill. She's sitting somewhere. Where is she? She's over somewhere. Where is my sister, Pat? She won't even stand my up. Sister. My sister, Pat, who's dear to me and used to take me to high school every single day, um, she is a part of that story, um, and that is that I was, when I was born, I'm the youngest of six kids in my family, and I'm really young in my family. She'll be annoyed that I said that, <laughs> but uh, my siblings are two decades and more old, older than me, and um, because of that, I was often told I wasn't planned, and, um, and because of that, the real gift that I got was I had these five people who were in front of me who I could observe and decide. And that really made a difference for me in terms of when you think about leadership. Also, because I was so young, I was not treated like a child. My, they took me very seriously. Anything that I needed or wanted to get done, my family was actually very, very responsive to me, um, despite all sorts of situations and circumstances. And they knew I was a kind of odd kid. I was really odd. You know, they say like the screw doesn't quite go in, mine didn't. Um, and that was something that they didn't make me feel bad about being different. They really um, protected and embraced me for those differences. So that, I think, really set the path for leadership in that I was very comfortable with who I was. I wasn't second guessing who I was and what I was about. And it was really about those siblings and my mother and the kind of themes that came up in our day to day conversations. And they're not theme, there are themes that are not unlike what all black kids experience from their parents over time and their siblings, and that the, the, how we get prepared for the lives that we are going to encounter and all the things that are going to happen to us. Excellent, great lessons. So all of us were mesmerized and transformed by uh, your TED Talk, what it means to be color brave versus color blind. That's language that I'm hearing more and more of, and I think it really speaks to the importance of action. Talk to us about where you think Chicago and the country fall in, on this spectrum today, color brave versus color blind. Well, we're certainly not color brave. And let me explain why I came up with that term. So like you, many of you, and you and I have had this conversation, have confronted lots of people who explain to you how color blind they are. And one day I was like, if you are so color blind, why is everyone around you white? Seriously. And I was like, this is something that just doesn't make sense to me. So now I'm actually going to ask you to see color. I don't want you to be colorblind. I want you to see and celebrate it and welcome it and invite it into your life. Notice it, talk about it, have the uncomfortable conversations, the ones that are risky and scary, because colorblind is not working for us as a society, this right. idea. And so when I think about where America is on this, we're in bad shape. It, like, I don't know how we've gone from bad to worse, but we did. Um, and that's not me being Pollyannish in any way about the struggles that we've had for centuries as people of color and not just black people, Hispanic people, people of different faiths and religions. You, you roll it all up there and it's just really gone down a bad path. I heard someone say very recently, and I wish I could remember who because I want to give them credit for it, America was born with a birth defect. And a birth defect doesn't mean that you are crippled or you can't lead a normal life. It just means it's something that is there and always will be there. And I think that we have to acknowledge that it's there and then recognize and figure out how we're going to move on. And I think it, it includes us as people of color where we have to recognize our role in this conversation as well. So. I think we're in bad shape. 
I have been devastated by some of the things that I have seen, as many of you have. I have felt a sense of responsibility and accountability of what can I do to affect change? How can I speak up more and be more of a voice for what is right, um, not debatable? Um, and yet, at every turn, I, I kind of feel like the bad guys are winning. We'll come back to that because one of the questions that we also had, and it is, it's, we'll talk about diversity fatigue, but what are the one or two things that people can do when they leave this luncheon today? And I think you've spoken to it and I often talk about it, that whole notion of being uncomfortable. If we're gonna work in this space, we have to be willing to be uncomfortable and that's the color brave piece. But tell us two or three things that we could do immediately upon leaving this luncheon, Melody, that might help advance the discourse and the courage. So I use this example in my TED talk. I talk about the fact that I swim, and I have this swim teacher, and he makes me wear these mittens. They're called fist gloves. And when you swim with them and you do a, a freestyle, you don't have your hands. And so somewhere in the, the part of our lesson, he'll say, you can take your gloves off. This is years of working with him. And he'll say, you can take your gloves off. And he says, but use your power for good, meaning my hands are going to give me power. Use them for good. And I've used that as a metaphor now in life. And I think that the one thing we all have to understand, we all have power in our own way. It's not about being famous or having money or being someone that people know in terms of a name or Ariel or anything like that. Every person in my firm, from receptionist to John Rogers, every place that I go, I feel that I'm speaking to people who have power. And I think we need to own our power and understand that we have to use that to affect change. We can't wait for it to happen. We have to take control. And when you look back to the civil rights movement, that's exactly what Martin Luther King did. It was, and I can barely actually hold the thought without becoming very emotional, it was 17, 18, 19-year-old kids on lunch counters. They weren't famous, rich. They didn't have giant educations. They were people just trying to affect change. And when I think about the sacrifices that they made, because they just recognized we have to do something. At Ariel, we have the saying, we've admired the problem long enough. We have to stop admiring the problem. So understanding our individual power, and that could be the hiring practices of our organization, the PTA meeting that we're sitting in, whatever circles or, or places where you are, how can you influence a more inclusive conversation and more inclusive environment? I also think it's very important that we speak our truth. And I know a lot of people are afraid. I know people say to me all the time, well, you can say that now. I said it then, which is why I'm sitting here. Yeah. I think sometimes we have this fear of what's going to happen to us. And I say this, you know, you can be elegant and graceful in, in pointing out injustice. You don't have to be militant and angry. Um, but I do think it's important to make sure that these your truth gets spoken, whatever it might be. And it could be something as subtle as what just happened to me, and I'm sure many people in this room, being in a meeting where someone doesn't make eye contact with you. I mean, it is, besides making me crazy, <laughs> who's going to say something? At some point, you've got to decide, you know? You need to make eye, you know, and there's ways you can do it. Um, so that's secondly speaking your truth. And the last thing I would say, which I think is important, is holding ourselves accountable. What I am amazed by is we actually have power to affect change. Connie and I were just talking about something coming out here. And it's some, a situation that didn't go the way neither one of I wanted it, neither one of us wanted it. And I said, I would just quit. I was like, I put a stake in the ground. Like, I'm not just happy to be here. So if it's not going to go the way I can actually meaningfully get something done, I am not going to waste my time. And I think we have to understand that. I always wonder why it is that certain people go into rooms and affect change and other people don't. And I think it's those people who, for whatever reason, have that extra confidence or maybe crazy, I don't know what it is, that allows them to dangle from that limb. And I had a person say something to me a long time ago. They said, Melody, we have no, I have no doubt. It was the CEO of, a chairman of Ask Jeeves, and it was at an Aspen Institute seminar. He said, I have no doubts that you will do good, but will you put yourself in harm's way and fight evil? And I was like, he's like, you can easily have an okay life writing checks and doing good and be unscathed, but will you put yourself in harm's way? And now I just tell people all the time, like, what is the worst thing could happen to me? 
And I say that to my colleagues all the time. Like, what could they do? Fire us? We'll get other jobs. Right? Dr. King referred to that as being creatively maladjusted. He talked about being creatively maladjusted against bigotry and those sorts of things. And I couldn't agree more. If we are in the room, we have to be willing to stand up for those things. And we have to be the examples for young people taking those courageous steps. Which brings me to, well, you mentioned being in the room and people won't look you in the eye. Talk to us about implicit or unconscious bias and how it can be addressed in the workplace. I know we do training for unconscious bias. People talk about that. How do we address that? And talk to us about ways you've seen or worked with it in the workplace. Well, I think it's all, we have to be ourselves. And so you do what is comfortable for you, which I think is so important. I do believe in being authentic. And I th believe in being unapologetic. And that is a statement that I learned from Tom Joyner. Tom Joyner gave one of the eulogies for John Johnson's funeral, and he called him unapologetically black. And it, like, blew me away. And I was like, that's what I dream of being. Like, why am I apologizing? And I thought of all the times I apologized, all the times for being black or being a woman. I had a situation with my business partner, John Rogers, where we were at a conference. I've told this story before. We were at a conference, and I was standing talking to another woman about clothes. <laughs> when you have a certain level of depravity, you end up having too much. <laughs> I'm one of those people. Um, so... We were talking about clothes, and um, John walks up to the conversation, and she said, oh, I'm sorry. This must be a conversation that really bores you. And I was like, wait a minute. He walked up to us, and we were having a conversation. And how many times have I walked up to two guys talking about last night's game? Neither one of them apologized to me, and they didn't stop the conversation. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So why can't it be okay for us to talk about Valentino? The whole notion of I'm sorry. I, when I mentor women, oftentimes before they say a sentence, they'll say I'm sorry, but. And so one of the things that I'm clear about is you don't have to be sorry. It's, it's true. Your presence doesn't mean that you have to be sorry. So, so I think the one thing about this unconscious bias and this inclusion, when we're in those environments, we have to However it works for you, make sure you are not being a bystander. Yeah. And however it works for you, I have a colleague who has just started working with me. She's been a month at Ariel. She's magnificent. She's six, one or two and beautiful, beautiful. And I met her when she came to see me because she was working at a very prestigious organization. And her boss was calling her Cookie Lion. a serious head neck roll. As well as the other black woman who had been there for eight years. And the other black woman didn't know how to stop it. And she walked in and said, my name is. So I was telling this story to a dear friend. And he was like, I was on Wall Street. And for six months, my bo boss called me Leroy. She's like, my name is Robbie. I thought about all the people around that situation that were complicit. Exactly. And that this person was 22 years old in this environment that they've never been in before. Like, my heart was so sad. But then I was so proud of the fact that she walked in and she was like, this is my name. Yes. And I told her after that, I said, you are going to work here. Absolutely. And she does now. I and said, those because that know. took a lot of courage when you're 22. And then, exactly, to be able to, and for those of you who don't know who Cookie Lyons is, she's a character in the show Empire, and she is hashtag extra. She really is. <laughs> so. Well, it was very funny, because she joked when she was like, couldn't I be Olivia Pope? Right. Or couldn't I have been? She was like, exactly. I, I'm Cookie Lyon, I'm ghetto fabulous, and, you know. Sure. And we were both laughing about for it, and sure. I was like, really? For sure. I think, though, more than anything, Melody, and you um, exemplified this, it's the point about courage and being present, and we talk often about America being this diverse country and diversity and inclusion. I, th I say inclusion requires equity and justice. But America is diverse. It's not necessarily inclusive, and you open no. with that. How do we achieve full inclusion in America? Is that I actually have an idea on this now. Okay, I, gave, I had to write a letter to my daughter for something that um, they were having all these people write letters to their children. And um, I really, really spent a lot of time trying to think about how to write this letter because it was going to be published. And... 
I ended up going to a letter, if you haven't read it, I strongly advise you to Google it, a letter that W.E.B. E. Du Bois wrote to his daughter Yolanda when she was 14 years old and leaving to go to boarding school in England alone. And it is the most amazing letter, unbelievably great and unbelievably moving. And it made me think a lot about my own mother who is no longer with us. And my mother used to say, Melody, you could be or do anything. So I wrote to Everest, I said, you can remember, you can be or do anything, but I want you to believe the same is true for anyone and everyone. And I wanna be in a society where everyone gets the benefit and no doubt. And so when I think about how can you actually shift this idea of inclusion, you actually expect not only that you can be exceptional, but you expect that everyone can. And you would think of the world and people in a much different way. Think if we thought of every cab driver and doorman, every janitor, every CEO, every ballerina, ice skater, whatever it is that these, these people have decided to do with their life, every single person as being capable of being exceptional. I think you look at the world in a much, much different way. And so that is my new thing that I'm anchored on. I want to expect exceptional. And I want to expect the person who's in the room with me has a good idea, no matter who they are. And that's what inclusion is. That's because you've listened to them, not just because they're diverse. You know, Clarence Thomas is diverse. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Everything that glitters isn't gold. Um, it, and, and I don't mean a knock on Clarence <laughs> Thomas. I'm true. just saying that's true. maybe not the same ideas that I have. Exactly. Yeah, one of the things I like saying to people is I see you especially young people, and that's what you're talking about. You see them, and you see them as having value. What are some of the most ideal factors that can make diversity work in companies, in our communities? I call it bringing the light versus the heat. And you bring the light when you talk about being Sometimes color Sometimes you need heat. Oh, you gotta have heat. It's already gotta be hot, and then you turn the light on for people to really see what it is. But what are some of the ideal factors that can I make it work? I think you end up, you know, I think that all slates in every company should be a diverse slate every single company. I think you have to force that. Mm -hmm. We had a professor that we had come speak at Ariel. So just so you know, we have people come to speak to us about these topics. We had these two professors from the University of Colorado come to speak to us and they said, actually, all their data shows that it can't be one diverse person in the slate, it's two. And that there's actually a fundamentally different outcome between all the data that they've studied where there's one diverse person in a slate of five or six versus two. And the likelihood of the diverse person being selected goes up not because there's another person, because it repositions that person as not being so different versus the others. I thought that was genius. I'd never thought about it, and I learned that just last year. So now I'm not just for one person on the slate to be diverse, but more than one. The other thing that I think is really important is that when you talk about this issue, it's not lip service. What I am always shocked by is the number of organizations say we're struggling with diversity. And I think about some of the CEOs that I know that are exceptional and demanding and have driven results. I mean, true results, or they wouldn't be in the big seats. And I wonder how, why is it on this one topic, it just plagues them. When everything else that they would demand, if you don't deliver, you don't work there anymore. So I had a friend explain this to me, it's like, you know, he mentioned the name of a CEO, and he's like, this person is a hard ass. He's like, if he says something's important and it doesn't happen, you do not work there. So if he says diversity is important and it doesn't happen, it's not important. So how do you make it important? I believe you have to tie pay to the outcome. At Ariel, we always say you get what you incent. So whatever you are trying to incent, you will get. So if you want to incent an inclusive and diverse environment, you have to pay people to, or hold back pay to make it happen. You have to have an organization where you can't be a superstar with a non-diverse group, that it's not possible. And people would get that message very, very clearly because we all know a lot of top, type A's work in the business world. And they want to be successful. So you tell them, how do I win? And then they say, okay, I know what the goals are. I know what the rules are. I will figure out how to win based upon what you told me. Well, that seems to be one of the, the goals that should be not just implicit, 
but more specifically sat financially for individuals and organizations that are struggling with this issue. In our last few seconds, I want to talk about this notion of white working class in America. We had a real interesting discussion about that, how this populist movement is moving towards the cluelessness, uh, some would say, about white working class. And how does that affect working poor blacks? What is the juxtaposition there, and how, that, how do you see that affecting diversity and inclusion in our country? Well, this is an interesting one, because I was struggling so much with this whole um, populist anger. I mean, struggling. I was like, I was literally, I had a genuine conversation with someone and I said, the people who really should be angry are black and Hispanic. I was like, we are the ones who have had true um, hardships for generations. And I don't think anger, as my husband says, what did he say, Yoda? Anger leads to hate yeah. and hate leads to suffering. suffering. We yeah. know that. <laughs> um, so I am not for it at all. Um, and so I was trying to understand this anger, and I had someone, this is not my original thought, I had someone say something to me that I thought was so profound. They said, when you are a person of color who has achieved any kind of success, you still have a lot of people in your family who are barely making it, and you are attached to them and connected. And many of us in the room, if you have a job, you know that that is true, right? Just a job. I mean that in the best ways, but you know what I'm talking about, right? There's a lot of calls, right? Okay. And he said, if you're Hispanic, you're still connected. And perhaps also if you are gay, lesbian, transgender, you know, keep going down the list. You have these connections that are very interesting. And he said to me, there are people also in these big categories that fight for you. So in the African-American community, with the Urban League, we have Reverend Jackson, Sharpton, go through the list. In the Hispanic community, La Raza, you have you know, uh, Univision, we can go through the list. In the uh, gay, lesbian, transgender, you know, so go think about it. He's like, people are fighting for them. And he said, this, it was a woman, excuse me, not a man, who gave me the speech, and she said, no one was fighting for poor whites. And if you were rich and white, you weren't necessarily connected to a poor white. Not that you, you were indifferent to them, you don't necessarily have the same connection that that African American does to their community. Now this isn't necessarily the truth, this was one person's perspective, and it, I thought about it for a long time, and I was like, that's pretty smart. And so no one was fighting for them, and suddenly someone comes along and says that they're fighting for them. When their perception is all these other groups have people fighting for them. And so it turned that populist sentiment into something that was really, really powerful and ultimately a wave that took over. I think the question for us now is to make sure now we understand we can't let that overwhelm the situation that we're in and we now have to really fight for ourselves to make sure not in a zero-sum game sort of way that you win, I lose because I don't see the world that way at all. I believe the pie can get bigger and bigger and we can all share in it. But I do believe we have to make sure more than ever that we are standing up for those people who have no voice and who have no one fighting for them. So I can tell you on some of my worst days where I'm exhausted and landing in the middle of the night and all sorts of crazy stuff that I seem to do regularly, um, I remind myself first and foremost that I'm not in a field picking cotton. And secondly, I remind myself I'm in a seat that a lot of black kids are counting on me. And it makes me get up and work harder. You know, people always joke with me. My last point. I happened to marry a rich guy. I did. But I've never stopped the work that I do, and I've never stopped working really hard. Because I can't afford to do that for my society. And we all, if we all understood that about ourselves, not just me, but everyone, we could have that same kind of wave. And that's what makes me really excited about the opportunities that are at hand for us. We have not been defeated, but we have to suit up. Thank you, Melody, and thank you for your courage, conviction, and commitment in the way you show up in the world. You energize and encourage all of us. And so we are just honored that you 
took some time to talk, and it's always great to see you. Thank you for everything you do for our community. And, and thank Connie you, Connie, too. And thank you, Urban League. You're an important organization. for such an inspirational and thought-provoking dialogue. You remind us all that as community leaders, we have a role to play as vocal and visible advocates for a more diverse and equitable workforce. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Keep it simple. Avoid graphics. Use key search words. Include metrics. And if you're black, whiten your resume. As we acknowledge bias and continue to fight racial disparities in Chicago and across the country, a person's name can still be a barrier to employment. So Emily gets the job, and Ebonita does not. And clearly, this digs deep into the roots of our organizations. This discriminatory practice is just as strong for businesses that claim to value diversity as those that don't. While we have taken enormous strides, we still have a long way to go before the hierarchy of business embraces a diverse culture. And it should flow from every C-suite to manager to employee. I believe that individually and collectively, we need to focus on three things. Stop thinking about what we can do for them, but more on what they can do for us. Recognize the inherent value in doing so and advance together through inclusion. Of course, ensuring that we do so means that we must talk about race and racism. Racism has and continues to be an ideological, systemic, and historic stratification process upon which codified discrimination, including slavery and Jim Crow, were founded. The clandestine ways in which it manifests itself in the workplace today has gross effects on the success of our city's black and brown residents. Perhaps not always as blatant, racism still stands as a phenomenon to overcome. It stands because it has been intentionally allowed to do so amidst our landscape of framed by the current political environment, environment of deep-seated prejudices and literal and figurative walls. While many businesses have made public commitments to increasing diversity in the workplace, these solutions have seldom brought about lasting change and equal opportunity for all. We are missing voices and perspectives. So many people are being denied opportunities that should be available to them, and in turn, businesses and society at large are losing out on undiscovered talent and creativity. When today only five black CEOs currently head Fortune 500 companies, and none of them are women, that is simply unacceptable by any measure. When upwards of 90% of blacks and 85% of Hispanics aged 16 to 24 in Chicago are unemployed, that is simply unacceptable by any measure. And while there is only, uh, there is only a 50% high school graduation rate among African Americans across the country, and when that happens, more than 60% of these graduates go on to college, but we're still not reaping the, the gains. The commitment to, the resilience of, and the belief in education is a long-standing cultural part of African American life. But the fruits of that belief have not been borne out. And that is simply unacceptable by any measure. In a city that has blossomed into a patchwork of ethnically diverse and culturally important neighborhoods for decades, the workplace should theoretically include people of all backgrounds and creeds. Yet this is not the reality. The color of business has remained overwhelmingly one tone. Indeed, race is at the epicenter of inequity, and it remains one of the most difficult and provocative things to talk about. It requires self-reflection and hard conversations. 
We all want to believe that we're free of bias, intolerance, and frankly, bigotry. That in 2017, this should still be an issue creates cognitive dissonance that lends itself to a conspiracy of silence. And in silence, there is tacit acceptance. And letting that fester serves no one, black, brown, or white. For in that silence, racism continues to operate insidiously within a veil of denial. To that end, the Chicago Urban League has been working to replace the silence with a resounding call to coalesce across divisions that history has created and continues to fragment us. Of course, working towards achieving racial equity requires much more than a good intention. It requires willingness to examine one's own beliefs about people from different racial backgrounds, as well as the level of privilege one may have had as a result of race and status and the benefits that flew, flow from that and continue to flow from that. The culture of passivity has not fared well for us, and we can no longer afford business as usual. In order to surpass the institutional and societal barriers that prevent people of color from accessing the same amenities as their peers, it is necessary to hold up a mirror to challenge the traditional ways business operate and embrace race and equity strategies. It requires a willingness to look at one's organization our company and conduct an honest assessment of whether or not the staff and management are reflective of the levels of diversity that exist within the communities that they serve. And then to make the necessary changes to practice real equity and inclusion. The color of business will only shift when we collectively grapple with the false narratives that represent our black and brown people. The successes of our summit innovators alone demonstrate that the reputation of a race solely as an indicator of success or for violence does not hold true. And so it is critical for this historic organization to lead the charge. It is central to our mission and vision that we have the discussion and continue to work to achieve economic and social equity on parallel tracks, both immediately and for future generations. Diversity and inclusion are not the only right things to do, they are good business. And I'm asking you to be a leader for equality, diversity, and inclusion. They are civil rights and imperative for the future socioeconomic viability of our city. We need all of you to be intentional in examining your organization's mission towards diversity and inclusion race and equity, and social justice. When you leave here, ask yourself, are you living up to your organization's stated commitment to diversity and inclusion? If the answer is no, then go get a mirror. Have your colleagues stand before it and make a change. If the answer is yes, then become the mirror, embody the mirror, be the mirror, because it is up to us to reflect the power of diversity. It's up to all of us to create an environment that embraces diversity rather than one that simply accommodates it. Be the force of change so that diversity and inclusion can reverberate and shatter the institutional walls that act as barriers in the workplace today. You know what, let's welcome Iquan back to the stage. Iquan, would you come and join me? Thank you so much for being here today and sharing a part of your story. During our centennial year, we have made a point to focus on changing the narrative regarding communities of color in Chicago. We have been doing this for 100 years, and Iquan, you're a prime example of why we do this work. You are critical to stoking the pipeline of access and opportunity. <laughs> Young men and women like Equan are why continued support is necessary in our community. The Chicago Urban League is committed to doing so. We've got this, but we cannot do it on our own. And so, this is the part of the afternoon where I ask you to join us by making a donation to the Chicago Urban League today. Red donation envelopes are on the middle of your table within easy reach, and our volunteers 
are standing by to collect them. You can also drop your donation in the collection boxes stationed at the back of the ballroom as you leave. I'm not gonna tell you how much to give. Absolutely every dollar makes a difference. I simply ask that you can be as generous as you can. Your donation is an affirmation of our collective obligation as keepers of our children's trust to help ensure that our youth do not have to surrender their life's choices before they ever even know what their possibilities are. Equan is living proof that they don't have to. Now it's time for the drawings for the Southwest Airlines round trip tickets. We will have one winner and Patty Green, the manager of community affairs and grassroots for Southwest Airlines is here to do the honors. The winner must be present to claim the prize. Time's gonna help me because it's hard to hold the bowl. You wanna choose or you wanna hold the bowl? I'll hold the bowl, you choose. I like that better. Thank you all so much. Southwest Airlines is so proud to be a long-term supporter of the Chicago Urban League and the great work that they do. So I thank you for joining me in, in supporting this great work. So let's let Equan choose a name. You can mix it up all you want. Right. And our winner is Christian B. Young, Senior Manager, Advisory Services, Ernst & Young. I'm guessing by the scream that person is still here. There you go. Come on up. Congratulations. Thank you. So nice. I'm really Thank you. Uh, thank you, Patty, and thank you, Southwest, and congratulations to our E&Y winner. <laughs> now, the Chicago Urban League would like to honor two individuals who've made a stronger and more equitable Chicago. Lester McKeever has devoted 44 years of dedicated service to our board of directors, and John Rogers has been a valued board member for 35 years. Together, they have exhibited a long-standing commitment to the league's board and have continued to act intentionally with respect to, to diversity and inclusion. Though they're leaving our active board, they will continue to serve the league and the city of Chicago as lifetime Chicago Urban League board members. We always say once an urban leaguer, always an urban leaguer. In no way do I think that either will stop speaking their truth. Please join me in giving these gentlemen a round of applause. And so we are within our one hour and a half. We we're actually seven minutes ahead. So thank you all for joining the 2017 Summit Luncheon Centennial Edition. Enjoy the rest of your day. Gonna make a change.